Well, let's turn to Luke chapter 12, please. Luke chapter 12. We will begin verse 22. And he said to his disciples, for this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable you are than the birds. And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his lifespan? If then you cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. But I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, you men of little faith? And do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink, and do not keep worrying. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek. But your Father knows that you need these things. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourselves money belts which do not wear out an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near nor moth destroys for where your treasure is there your heart will be also heavenly father thank you for this wonderful passage challenging passage one that goes against the grain of many um, things that we have already considered as truths are our, our um, our whole belief system of the Western civilization is at variance with some of the things that are here. Help us, Lord, first of all, to understand that we need to doft our cap and defer our um, reasoning to the wonder of your revelation. And so, Lord, help us to be teachable. Help us to learn the right things. And then, Lord, help us to, because of that, go out from here being more obedient and effective disciples for you. And we commit ourselves in this time afresh into your hands to that purpose. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, last week we were in a passage that was describing a rich fool. A rich fool, a, fool, a, a man... Uh, had a wonderful crop, and the term that was used for an abundant crop is where we get our word euphoria from. So he was experiencing a euphoria over something that he could not store up for himself and would never enjoy for himself as life would have it, as providence would have it. And it was a tragedy because himself was all he ever was intending to have, have access to his euphoric crop. In the end, he saw no personal benefit from his windfall. That story, that parable, was occasioned by another fool who had interrupted Jesus and demanded that Jesus intervene in the dispossession of an inheritance. All were warned on that basis uh, warned to be on guard against every form of greed. The very issue was one that over the past months, Jesus had apparently spoken of with some frequency, as we see very similar things being taught on a number of occasions, including the Sermon on the Mount. It becomes very clear that this was one of the regular things 
that he was teaching wherever he went. So there's, it's, this isn't not, this is not a one-off. Uh, this is a situation where this was one of those baseline teachings of our Lord. In verse 22, he says, and for this reason I say to you, uh, what reason? Well, the reason was that there were people living exclusively for themselves and hoarding resources as a clutching grasp of stuff for their personal security. Their stuff was their security. And they were selfishly planning to use any surplus that they had generated for nothing but themselves. And actually, in this situation, to finance indolence, indulgence, and ease, rather than using a time of surplus for meeting needs in the lives of others. For that reason, for that reason, Jesus said to his disciples, don't, and here we're going to have a word that occurs frequently in this text and many others, do not merimnate. Don't merimnate. The term means to be vexed, to be constantly fussing. The etymology of the word, the base root word, is to divide, to divide. And so the idea is to be of divided interests or distracted from what you are to be giving your attention to. When people uh, in the New Testament were talked about as being anxious, it meant that they were li literally of a divided mind. They were in two minds. I think I should be doing this, but on the other hand, I think I should be doing this. And then they're fussing and they're fretting, right? So that was the idea of being anxious, being in two minds or being a divided mind. Here it is talking about being of distracted a mind, a mind where here is what your task is, but you're constantly being distracted from what you're called to do. In verse 22, he says, do not worry. What's this passage about? Well, I don't know. And, and, I, and I don't want you to walk out of here thinking, um, man, I need to memorize the pastor's outline. Uh, I'm, I'm not... I'm never uh, really big on you walking out of here with a pastor's, you know, outline that, that all the lead points print out Super Bowl or something. I, I don't want you to do that. I don't want you walking out of here with, with a pastor's anagram. What I want you to walk out of here is going, I don't know what that guy said. I can't remember a thing. But, oh, that passage, I know what that passage means. That's what I want. And one of the things you're going to keep on hearing in this is, do not worry. Don't marinate. Don't be constantly fussing. Verse 25. And which of you by worrying can add? Uh, verse 26. Why do you worry? Verse 29. Do not keep worrying. And then as kind of to really kind of encapsulate verse 20, verse 32. Do not be afraid, little flock. Uh, any idea what this passage would be talking about? Yeah, don't worry. Don't be constantly, frantically fretting and fussing. Don't worry. Don't be being afraid. So the passage is about being distracted from the task given to you by your commander, by your master, being distracted by worry. The passage is about having anxiety issues, panic attacks, or just basic functioning, a flawed fixation in life. Our world, have you noticed, is an anxious world, isn't it? Boy, there's a lot of people, and they have, what you'd say, anxiety issues. It's an anxious world. That we live in. There's a multi-billion dollar industry devoted to methodologies, to treatments, to courses you can go to, to pharmaceuticals, there's a big one, and all on how to manage stress and anxiety, right? We're familiar with that. 
There's never a thought about completely dispelling the frantic mental barking dog, only achieving some sort of management strategy over this. Because if the problem went away, of course, so does their ability to extract some money from it. But this whole thing about anxiety is by no means new. There was anxiety among the unsaved then too. We see that verse 30. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek. They are constantly, absolutely captivated by this. This is their world. Fussing and fretting about how to acquire more stuff. If there is one God, if there's one religious perspective of life, it is acquisitiveness. I need to get more. I need to find a way that I can maintain more. I need to make sure that nobody can take it from me. Uh, that thieves cannot break through and steal, etc. Well, the nations around the world are continually, frantically seeking and striving and grasping and trying to hide and trying to get enough stuff because stuff is what they understand gives them security. And uh, the doctrine of the world to have, maintain, and tenaciously guard a surplus is sold as what security is. And even in a more uh, pronounced way, there's a whole industry and you are called preppers. And it isn't just a situation where, man, if the power goes out, we've got a way to keep the house warm. That's not the deal. And you know, it's, it goes well beyond just, you know, you know, basically anticipating that life could have a problem or two. It is a whole worldview where I need to have about 15 years of K rations, and then I need to have a pile almost as big of ammo so that if anyone comes after my K rations, I can blast them into another time zone. And it's just about acquiring, acquiring, keeping, keeping, maintaining, guarding, because security is the multitude, the multiplying of stuff. So there's a whole mindset of that, right? Well, in our passage, we're gonna learn anxiety management. Oh, no, we're not. We're going to learn anxiety banishment. We're going to learn anxiety banishment. Jesus does not set out a course on how to manage anxiety and panic. He forbids it. He said, you typically do fuss and fume. And you are typically anxious about these things. That's intuitive. That is innate to you. I, I have every expectation that that's what's going on in your heart. And so here's the solution. Stop it. That's pretty complex, isn't it? That's really profound. Stop it. Kind of sounds a bit like the Bob Newhart sketch. Stop it, which is, of course, regarded as counseling with comic proportions of unrealistic insensitivity. But, but Jesus also, in the passage here, will give a methodology on how to stop it. But first of all, you have to understand, stop it. Stop it. And before we're finished here, I hope that you learn to... Well, in this passage, we'll see that the complete cure for anxiety involves marshalling your thought processes, controlling your thoughts, which you as a believer, if you are a believer, you have a newfound ability to do. If he had given you a command and you had no ability to do that, that would be a non sequitur. He gives the command, therefore you are able, right? You know how that works, right? Romans chapter 6, no reckon, yield, obey. No, you've set, been set loose from free, from sin. You're no longer a slave of sin. You need to know that. You go, well, I don't know if it, I, I don't know if I feel that way. I, 
that doesn't matter what you feel. Know that you've been set free from the power of sin. I want you to reckon it. I want you to now proceed on the basis that that is true. Uh, reorient, recalibrate your system. You are free from sin. You can walk away from the slavery of sin. Well, how do you do that? Yield. You start up, you get up in the morning and you say, not my will, but your will be done. I don't have a will in this anymore. You're my master. I'm the slave. You tell me what to do. I go do it. Yield your heart. And guess what? Now you've got the power to obey. When you yield yourself to the Holy Spirit on that basis, you will be granted the supernatural spirit enabled power to walk away from sin and obey him there but we go on if you're a genuine disciple now you've received a new nature and a new set of abilities you're able to do it and it is marshalling your thoughts according to some basic theology the providence of God it involves choosing what you love the most with the greatest loyalty as to an ordering of your life, which is supposed to be, which actually is, the moment by moment, day by day behavior of a mathetes alethes, a disciple indeed. A true disciple. That's what disciples do. And so doing what disciples do automatically enables you to walk away from anxiety. We're going to get to that. He says, do not marinate about your life. And the word life there is not bios, which is, you got a pulse. It is, don't marinate, be fussing about your suke, which is body, soul, spirit, the whole, the whole package of the you. Everything that's involved in your life, don't be don't be constantly fussing about that. And perhaps it would be helpful to put the emphasis on the right syllable here, the, the correct word in this sentence, which is, don't be continually fussing about your life. Ooh, that's what's being said. It doesn't mean that you don't have any effort. It doesn't mean that you're no longer, that you're, you're some sort of a drifter and a grifter and an easy taker, that's, not what, that's definitely not what's going to go on. But he says, I don't want you to be constantly fussing about your life. Well, that kind of sounds like that discipleship thing again. Yes, it is. And then Jesus clarifies the categories, the specifics of things we should not get distracted about. He's not saying, I, I need you to lay off worrying about air conditioning and what, how you're going to furnish your vacation home. That's not what's the deal. He says, here's what I want you to stop worrying about. Food and clothing. And as soon as I say that, there's this thing that kind of screams out in your head, don't worry about food and clothing. Are you serious? Don't worry about food and clothing. But those are basic necessities. You need food and clothing for life. People who live under a bridge with their belongings in a stolen shopping cart need food and clothing, right? You need food and clothing. Don't worry about your food and clothing. Exactly. That's what he's saying. So don't worry. You need those things. And so he says, and so because of that, don't worry. Now, follow the reasoning. Sir, first of all, verse 24. He says, verse 23, the life is more than food and the body more than clothing. There's more to your life than your stuff. But there's some reasoning we need to be marshalling. Verse 24, consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. No ravens, oh, seed drill. No ravens, thankfully, are making payments on any green paint. They don't sow, they don't reap, they have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable you are than birds. 
So, what is he saying here? Well, God provides food for ravens. God even provides food for common, ceremonially unclean carrion birds, lowest on the totem pole of valuable birds. Okay? You can't eat them, to my knowledge. I've eaten pretty well everything across through the bush. I've never eaten a raven, haven't gone there. I've eaten like a raven sometimes when I'm on a, but I've never eaten raven. They are kind of low on the totem pole, but God's, God provides for them. What's he saying? Walmart has never sold a stackable, stackable rub tote to a hummingbird. Hasn't happened yet. Butler Bin Company has never sold a thing to a raven or to a whiskey jack. They just, they aren't on that Rolodex client list. And after all these thousands of years, here they are, still around. They're still here. Why? Because there is not just a once a year dispensation, there is a daily or more frequently God attended, God attention, provision for this mass of creatures individually that really, in, in the eternal end of things, don't matter that much. But God is continually about that. Note the manner of provision, though, lest there should be somebody here going, wow, this sounds like the 60s, come on people now smile on your brother everybody get together try and love one another I think we're just going to kind of groove in and drop out uh, why have a job no listen to how the provision goes God affirms that he provides but this provision involves a good deal of effort and action as a responsibility of the birds birds rarely lounge have you ever seen a bird who is needing to have some sort of remediation because he'd been sitting on a, on a stool for a really long time and got a sunburn? That's, that's not the behavior of birds. Birds rarely lounge. And the food that God says, I'm providing for them, is never the product of indolence or neglect of duty. They go, they scurry, they flit around, they gather it. So there is some responsibility God always requires of people who he's providing for. Go back, if you will, to uh, the Israelites who were in the desert. Remember, uh, when we were looking through the Gospel of John, Jesus did the thing where he fed basically three cruise ships full of people. And some people are going, oh man, this is like the golden days. This is awesome. Where, where we're just going to have the big, you know, the, the big food line. Uh, Lord, do this every day, all the time. We, we want more of this. You know, and kind of prove that you've got the same stuff that Moses did. And let's have a permanent, you know, a soup kitchen situation. No, th think about that a little bit. Even when God was providing manna, and, and he was providing it without question, uh, manna was provided by God, but if an Israelite stayed in his tent until noon, the manna was gone. He might very well and very properly go hungry, hungry in the middle of God's abundant provision. So there's always going to be a requirement of action and indolence is always going to yield something where you are in want. In fact, it says, if you are indolent and if there's a little bit of a folding of the hands and if you say, well, God's going to just provide this for me and I think I'll sit back and, and, and sleep a little bit here. Your want will come upon you like an armed man. There's a promise. Okay? So, in the middle of God's provision, don't understand. I hope nobody understands from here. Oh, reform by grace is against uh, gainful employment and hard work. No, in fact, the whole Christian ethic is work hard, generate enough for yourself, generate a surplus, and give the surplus away. Okay, that's, that's godly Christian living. It isn't uh, sit back and become an easy taker. As a, as a pastor of this church, I need to be protecting you 
the people of here from people who are easy takers. And uh, that was one of the responsibilities that is very carefully outlined in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. Well, verse 28, he says, or verse 27, consider the lilies, how they grow. The word for lilies there, uh, we Im immediately think of some white thing. The flower it looks like that was in question was a royal purple uh, affair, big, beautiful, fragrant flower that uh, they worked really hard to get garments of that splendor and color. That's the, the actual plant that they're talking about here. How they neither toil nor spin. They aren't responsible for, uh, you know, getting that mollusk and squashing it and, and, and getting the dye and, and dyeing the threads and then putting it on. They don't do any of that stuff. God provides that. They don't toil. They don't spin. But I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass in the field, in other words, he gives them, the, he gives the grass vegetation. Matter of fact, he also gives them flower. And you go, yeah, grass has flower. Yeah, it does. Uh, and, and those of you, there's some of you who uh, are just went to the um, drugstore and you're going, do you have any Claritin? Because you have, call it hay fever. Well, there's all of these grasses even, they have flower and they're releasing pollen and the, the flowering uh, season for Festuca rebrubus, creeping red fescues, really, really short, but it's there, and, and God is providing all of that. It says it's, which is alive today and tomorrow thrown into the furnace and used, used to, you know, a quick start for a fire. How much more will he clothe you, you men of little faith? So, he says, God provides clothing, respectable, even stylish clothing for flowers and even grass. God provides for them. So here's the first stop it. Do not keep worrying. Stop thinking, listen, stop thinking and living like a functional atheist. Are you a functional atheist? No, 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 I, I believe in God. But when it comes right down to it on the nitty gritty push of the day, you go, oh man, I hope it doesn't rain. What is the antecedent of the word it? Mother nature? What, what are you thinking is causing the rain? I hope it is warm outside. Man, the, the, uh, our earlier forebears in the faith were a lot better in their diction. I believe the Lord will bless us with rain today. It was all understood to be something from the hand of God, not an it or a mother nature. Uh, my wife and I were um, watching on occasion a program called Alone, because that's got to be uplifting. But in, in the middle of that, here's these people out in the bush and they're starving to death and they're having a horrible time. Not one of them goes out and shoots a deer. I, but anyway, whatever. I'll, I, I haven't been there. But anyway, they, they get a fish and they're so excited. And so at the end of the day, they're, they're feeling thankful, but they're, they're bankrupt because they don't know who to thank. And so they say, oh, thank you, fish. Be assured, fish it wasn't his idea. And he didn't, the fish didn't give you anything. And the fish is dead. And so thanking the fish is really an unproductive issue. But it's all about animism and all of that. And people are thankful. They don't come around Thanksgiving Day. They're thankful. They don't have a clue who to thank or what to thank. Because they're functional atheists. Men and women who have been redeemed and bought by Christ don't think, don't proceed like functional atheists. Like there's a God in heaven. See, guys like Newton, they were, they were deists. But 
being a deist made them kind of like a functional atheist. They, they believed that God sort of got this whole thing called creation going and then basically stood back and watched with his hands in the folds of his garment. That's not the God described in this Bible. The God described in this Bible is not one sparrow kind of flits to the ground apart from what? The will of my father. He's micromanaging all points of even what are, we would describe as the insignificant movements of insignificant birds. So don't be proceeding as a functional atheist. God is continually micromanaging his world. Stop living your life like there's no God who's continually, wisely, graciously, powerfully, and ably micromanaging everything that comes into your life. Because that's what God describes is happening for you if you're a disciple. Verse 23, for your life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Okay. The purpose for your life is not merely for survival. What did God save you for? Well, let's do a little review. You're very familiar with these words, but let's review them anyway. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I'd like to start back in verse 4, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love. There's, there's some of the first um, preconditions, some of the first thoughts that we need to be affirming about God. Rich in mercy, great love. But because of those things of great love with which he loved us, even while we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. The fact that you have a relationship with God is done so at the initiative and the enabling of God. Not you. The mercy and the love of God was shed abroad while you were still shaking your fist at God. It's an amazing thought. He raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He gave us a position. He gave us a legal position of, ex of absolute equity with the risen Son of God. Consider that for a moment when you're thinking about the vicissitudes, the bad stuff in life. Here's what he's done for you. Remind yourself of that. So then in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You know this passage, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that, what is the antecedent of that? Faith. Faith was given by God. And that, not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. And then we quit there. That's too bad. We need the next verse. For we are his workmanship, and it's the word where we get our word poem, our composition. He's, we are his composition, created in Christ Jesus for good works. There was more than just, I think I'm going to save these people, and then maybe we'll drop them off with a, Make America great red hat again and drop them off in Tehran. Let's see if they can survive. Man, I, I hope they can run fast. It wasn't just the idea that he was going to rescue them. There's a whole program here, right? You were created in Christ Jesus for good works. And in case you didn't quite get all of that, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. There's an agenda of which you are a part. 
Wow. So the purpose for your life is not mere survival. God did not just short-sightedly rescue you from certain destruction and then, well, no idea. Try and see if you can keep your al yourself alive somehow, son. That's not what's going on. Give God a little credit. He has a plan. He has actually a rather comprehensive plan of which if you're a disciple, you are a part. He has a plan for your life, right? God has not just redeemed his elect and then abandoned them in a harsh world where they will be soon annihilated because the plan and the provision ended in salvation. He has ordered the specifics of their service detail all the way until they get to glory. You have a service detail that is put on your clipboard that you were foreordained to when you got the, at, at the same time in which you were ordained to receive salvation, you, there was a game plan of stuff you were to do because he's the master and you're a slave. There's a service detail assigned individually to every individual believer. He has some things he's going to hand over to you for you to do, some stuff he's going to put on your plate. He has ordered the specifics of your life service detail. It's not random. It's not chance. It's carefully prepared and thought out. He will therefore be in charge of what provisions you need, when you need them, how much you will need. It will not be a situation where God has a comprehensive plan that you as a disciple are an integral part of, but oops, just before Billy got to the service detail plan from the foundation of the world, who knew? Billy up and starved himself to death. He ran out of food weeks before he got to the stuff God had called him to do. Wow. Billy needed food, it turns out. Well, this is awkward. God never thought of that part of the plan, right? How short-sighted and ill-prepared do you imagine God to be? Verse 30. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek. They're all obsessed with it. But your father knows that you have need of these things. Stop for emphasis on a few of those key words. Your father knows. This is somebody different than the CEO of the company, 15 regions above you, who doesn't really know about you, doesn't know any of the personal parts of your, of your life, uh, you're, you're just a commodity like a cinder block. This is your father. And he deliberately appeals to that because there's a personal connection. Um, you were begotten, you were born again as an individual work of God. He is intimately involved in your life. He knows all of the details of your life and he knows what you need. He knows. Of course God knows. And it's your father who knows. And, and it's not just a, <laughs> well, I don't know. He's going to need a lot of cans of beans. Hope, hope that works out for him. What kind of a father? Is, is, that how, is that how you behave as a father? Look at those kids. They're baking around here someplace. Hopefully they find it before they fall over. Is that the kind of dad you are? Why, why would you think your father in heaven is, is like that? A father like that, they'd be locking up in prison. Right? Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5.
Verse 6, he says, therefore humble yourselves into the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. Casting all your anxiety on him. And it's an interesting idea here. It's rolling it over onto him, but it is a deliberate act of the will. It is not something that just sort of you stumble into, it just kind of happens. It is absolutely something that is very deliberate. You roll it over onto him. Anything that you would be anxious about, anything that you'd be fretting about, that's a command. Roll it over onto him. Cast what? All your anxiety on him. And I love this phrase. Because he cares for you, you decide to throw it upon him. Why? Because of a promise. Because of a promise. And that last phrase means your welfare is his concern. Your welfare is his responsibility. He has deliberately taken it on as his cause. Your welfare, he's saying, I'm now responsible for. I'll be on the hook for that. Wow. Well, where did you get that idea, Peter? Oh, by the way, little anecdote from history. Little anecdote from history. Um, there was a pagan, uh, Greek, he was worshiping false gods, and his name was Titedios. And he had a surname, but nobody knows what the surname is now. Because Titedios got saved. The one thing we know about Titedios was he's a, he was a warrior. He was a fretter. He was a guy who was obsessed about all the stuff that could happen, all the stuff that he thought was going to happen, and, and his stuff. That's who he was. But he got saved. And, and because he got saved, it changed his thinking process. It changed his relationship, his outlook on life. It changed his culture. Oh, did one more. It changed his surname. From then on, this was so much a feature of this guy the awareness that I have a God in heaven and he's sovereign, it was so much a part of his life, his surname was changed to Amerinos. Oh, you heard the word Marinos, warrior, and it's with the Alpha Primitive in front of it. Here is the guy who now saved, now never worried, ever. And the unsaved world says, oh, that's Tetedios, the guy doesn't worry anymore, ever. Because he was possessed of good theology. Oh, God is my provider. I'm, why would I worry? What, what does my worrying betray? Right? Anyway, why, why, would, why would Peter pass on that kind of a promise that, that God is saying from here on in, Things like food and clothing is God's responsibility. Where'd you get that idea, Peter? Well, because P Peter was standing right there when Jesus solemnly told, verse 24. He says, you're more valuable than birds. I'm going to provide. He's saying, you're more valuable than grass. I'm going to clothe you. He says, and do not seek what you will eat and what you'll drink and do not keep worrying. Don't keep worrying. But seek his kingdom. Oh, that's what you're supposed to be concentrating on. And that doesn't mean that you're sitting back in a lounger. That means you're working. That, that means you're diligent. That means you're, you're zealous. That, that, that means you're not staring at work. You're doing work, right? But seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. God's going to take care of that if you're one of his workmen. He's going to... It's going to make sure you got the tools and everything you need. It's 
It's an argument from the lesser to the greater in all of these cases. If he's taking care of crows, if he's taking care of ravens, if he's taking care of grass that gets burned. To worry is an expression of doubt about God's basic ability to administrate a critical aspect of his universe and his plan. And it's a constructive denial of your confidence in his acumen and ability and basic goodness. If you worry. Verse 27. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. But I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory was clothed like one of these. God effortlessly, continuously does greater in much less important arenas like flowers. He puts on a massive display of his ability to marshal what he wishes, even with grass. Grass goes into flower for mere hours, but God continually pulls this thing off whenever and wherever he wishes. Do you fancy that God is likely to fail at a more important critical duty? Do you imagine God to be incompetent to carry through on what he has on multiple occasions solemnly promised? Our worry is an obvious, running, doubting criticism of his competence and his caring. It is, in verse 32, or 28 says, an issue of faith, O ye of little faith. Do you trust to do God to do what he's committed himself to do? If he has said, our welfare, he has taken on as his responsibility. God has ordered the specifics of the service details of his disciples. He's committed himself to the responsibility for the provisions of the service detail. <clears throat> oh, and we missed a verse. He's carefully ordered the length of commission for their service detail, verse 25. And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his lifespan. How many of you, by doing this and doing that, can actually alter the very day and the very hour where God has ordained in, before there was a day, before, what he, the day and the hour that you were going to die? Can, are you going to be able to change that? Is the question. When Jesus asked this question, there was an obvious answer to the question that everybody knew. They would chuckle and go, well, yeah, no, of course not. They had Psalm 139 in their hymn book. They knew that. Now, if you were to ask this question in today's church and ask for a show of hands, there may well be a landslide in the wrong side. So I won't bother doing that. Because we've been told, we're, we're continually pummeled. If you cut all the red meat out of your diet, you can add four years to your life. If you cut all the GMO out of your diet, you could lengthen your life by a decade. Do you really think so? Do you really think so? And is that think subject to the revelation of God? Let me be a little bit clearer. No, you can't. No, you can't. Oh, there's some things you could do through some discipline and through carefulness. You could end up that you get to the last day of your life and you're 185 pounds of muscle and gristle instead of 300 and some pounds of whatever else. So there's some, there's some things where you can get to the end of your life and things are more comfortable and, you can, and easily more accomplished. But, but you're not going to add an hour. And, and there is nothing that's going to subtract an hour from your life. He wrote down in a book, he says, when you die. He wrote the number down because that was the number he was allotting to you. This wasn't because he's saying, hey, I got a line on trivia. You want to know how much trivia I know? I know when he's going to die. He looked down the corridor of time. This is a neat trick. No. 
It's not about what he knows. It's what he ordained. What he decided. Yes, he knows every detail, but this is his ordinance. He's decreeing and carrying out a plan with authority. This is the number he decided. That number will not be utterly, that number will be utterly unaffected by, listen, it will not be affected by cancer, falling rocks, TDS, tofu deficiency syndrome, cholesterol levels, germs, viruses, or some dingbat with a gun. I do believe, as the Scots would say, if you're to die by drowning, you'll need be struck by lightning. It's true. You cannot add to the length of your life by what you do. You are not the preserver of your life. You will die when God says, how he says, where he says, if he says. Your commanding regent, if you are a believer, has ordered the specifics of the service detail of his disciples. He's committed himself to the responsibility for the provisions during that service detail. And now he has carefully ordered the length of commission of their service detail. What a relief. Seriously. Do you want to live 15 more minutes than what you have work on earth to do? What kind of a place do you think heaven is? You think it's a slum? What, what kind of a place? Do you think it's a boring place? Man, if I've got no more work to do, get me out of here. I, I could kind of ramble on in three days and blow everything. Just get me out of here when my work's done. I'm out of here. Right? I act, weird, I actually believe in heaven. Hope you do. To be anxious is really very insulting to God. But again, we say in verse 30, your father knows that you have need of these things. Father, verse 32, your father, your father. What kind of a deadbeat, insensitive, cruel, fumbling, thoughtless father do you imagine your father in heaven to be? To be continually anxious about even one thing in your world is an act of functional atheism that is a running disbelief in God's capability to provide for his universe. It is a running disbelief in his wisdom, in his goodness, his anticipation of needs, and his basic stance of a loving, providing, caring father. So, stop it. Stop it. But how? Oh, look at that. This passage even gives some idea of the methodology of the how. <coughs> Verse 24, consider. That's a word that means be constantly <clears throat> giving the attention of your mind to this thing. He says, <clears throat> pardon me, in verse 27, consider. Consider. Reason it through rationally. But the word actually means fix your mind on this. So it's actually, he's saying, one of the first steps in the whole issue of anxiety, dismissal, is thought displacement. Instead of mumbling around and letting your, your mind go chasing after whatever butterflies it's going after, you take charge of your mind and you marshal it so it's starting to consider some things. Displace the sinful, disobedient, God-belittling habit of worrying with fixing your mind on his evident capable capability and his track record of providing for lesser things at a staggering performance level for millennia. You want something to... When you're going down the road and you're going, man, what are we going to do if the gas goes up another 10 cents? Man... Are we going to have enough rhubarb preserves? I don't know if, if, if we have enough cans of pickled beets. Do you really want to kind of have that on your ledger? You're driving down the road, you had this time, and that's what you put your mind on? 
take charge of your thinking, start considering all the places and all the things that God does with beautiful, wonderful responsibility and acumen. Man, consider the, the abilities of my God. Fix your mind on that. And then verse 31, verse 31, but seek his kingdom, but seek his kingdom. Occupy your attention of seeking, aiming at, craving at, being preoccupied with, with the kingdom, with doing the work that God gave you to do. God's work, the work, the commissioning God has called you to. Instead of being distracted, merimnos, into considering what in the world, um, where am I going to get a good deal on socks, be considering, oh yeah, what was the task God gave me to do? And how can I do a better job of that? And if you occupy your mind with that, guess what? You're not anxious. You're not needing to pop pills. You're not needing to go off in some room, go, oh, mm, you know, you know, try to... and all that stuff that they say you're supposed to be helping you with your anxiety. When we just straight up obey this command to stop being anxious as an issue of basic obedience and me embracing the Lordship of Jesus over my life. And then we marshal our thinking to consider God's obvious extraordinary ability to provide for whatever he wishes. And then as we channel our thoughts and how we can more effectively carry out our service detail, we don't have time for fuss and worry. Use your brain as a slave of Jesus and you can walk away for panic from panic attacks for life. By the way, you, as you walked in here, you probably knew that. Probably not new to you. Why do we get distracted from our service detail? Well, often we're not really sure God will provide for us at the timing we like. Everybody wants to live by faith. Nobody wants to have an empty deep freeze. Weird. Everyone says, oh, I love this living by faith. Nobody likes to have an empty bank account going, ooh, how are we going to make it? So we're not sure God will provide for us at the right time, a timing we like. We're not sure that God will provide at a standard of living we would prefer. And we might not get everything we think we need at the caliber we think we're entitled to. What if? What if God is content for us to live at a lower standard of living than everyone else that we give our attention to? If we stop advocating and striving and living by our own cunning for our own needs, will God have us in a place we consider a slum or an impoverished state or what we're dissatisfied with? Who do you think God is? What is your impression of God as your father? He says, don't be afraid, little flock, verse 32, for your father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. This is the father that's taking you to heaven, right? This is the father that after your service detail is done, he doesn't drop you off at the men's hostel. He takes you to glory, heaven. They use gold for asphalt. He knows well what you want and what you crave. And wonderfully, he's a father who's wise enough and kind enough and faithful enough to give you what you need, not what you think you need. Good thing. Question, do you want to live do you want to be living longer than you have service detail for? I hope not. Is the one goal of your life to extend your life? Sorry. That's a bankrupt goal. Do you want to live at a higher standard of living than God would provide for you or approve of? Ooh, there's a rub. You content with the giving 
and the provision of God. You know, you know what joy is, right? Joy. Joy is contentment and satisfaction with the provisions and dealings with God in your life. Do you have joy? Have you decided to take contentment and satisfaction with what God has provided in your life? Now, that's joy. The verb tense of that is rejoice. You are commanded to rejoice, to take joy, to decide I'm content and I'm satisfied with what God's doing in my life. You there? Is the life of a hoarding prepper who's planning in a detailed way to shoot hungry people who would take his nine years of K-rations the life of a serving, obedient disciple? You think? Here's how you overcome anxiety. You commit yourself and your family to his marching orders. And he gives you the provisions as you march and what you need to do the jobs he's lined up for you. If your first consideration is the service detail, you're not fussing and stressing about whether you're issued a 10-man hot tub or a bucket of water. And when your well-scheduled, carefully planned service detail is completed, he does what? He takes you to paradise. That's the kind of dad, that's the kind of father this is. There's no sketchy, ill-conceived parts to this plan, including eternity. He says, for example, when he adopted you into the family of God, you became an heir. Oh, what kind of an heir? A joint heir with Christ. What does Christ inherit? All things. All things. Well, let's say there's let's say there's two billion believers who go to heaven. What's a two billion share of infinity? Somebody in math help me out here. What's a two billion share of infinity? Yeah, infinity. He takes you to paradise, guys. That's that's the level of attention here. Last week we considered the Thessalonians. Say that quick. The Thessalonians. And he was telling the folks at Corinth, they gave away more than they could afford. Wow. Oh no. Now their lives are ruined. Because they gave away. No. Now what? They gave away more than they could afford. Hey, guys, what if you blow it in a moment of compassion and you give away what you actually need for your upcoming service detail? Now what's going to happen? Now you're going to go broke. You'll be out in the street. You, you'll not get the job done that God has called you to. Your life could be horrible from now on. And really, it's over with no way back, right? Oh, there's a verse for that. Not an app for that. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Second Corinthians chapter 9. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he is purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. As you go along, you're supposed to be displaying a family likeness of being generous with the stuff God's given you. And what is, is there some sort of a formula where if you break the formula, all of a sudden you broke the bank and, and now you're going to be in Dutch? What is the rule? As you purpose in your heart? As, as God purposes, motivates in your heart. Um, and he says, for God loves a cheerful giver. You know, that's the word hilarious. So lighthearted, boy, wonderfully lightheartedly is able to um, give away his stuff when he sees need. And then what? 
and God is able to make all grace abound to you, he can do that, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. He talks about sowing here in a minute. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed for the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. God says, here's an area, an arena of service I want to go in. Here's your resources. Then you go along and you go, man, I can't see enough seed on the ground. You throw a little bit more and go, that looks a bit light yet. And you throw a little bit more and you get about halfway done. You go, oh man, I ran out of seed. Well, what's God going to do? Well, he's probably hit you with a lightning bolt. What's he going to do if what you're doing is out of a good heart and out of service? Multiply your seed. Oh, bags full. Keep seeding. And, and out of that, actually multiply your, your crop. Um, he's not going to penalize you for stuff like that. He's going to supply. Um, you will be enriched in everything for all... Oh, watch this one. Liberality. He will enable you to be generous. If God puts more stuff in your pack and you go, Woo-ha! I'm going to love living at this standard of living. Watch it evaporate. In fact, he promises it'll do that. He promises it'll do that. It says that in the book of Haggai. If, if, if you're more focused on your stuff than on God's stuff, he says, it's like you have put all your stuff into a purse with holes. You, you, you have all this stuff, and you go, oh, look at all my stuff. And then you go to get your stuff and go, what happened to it? And, and, and it just kind of goes through your fingers like sand. Why? Because it's not being multiplied, because it's not being, because you're living for yourself. I knew that when, when we went up to Fort McMurray and we were living on big wages. I knew if I start where we start living to the standard of living we're able now, and, and we start saying, man, this is great. Every kid needs a boat. Every kid needs a quad. If we start doing that, watch provision dry up. Why? Because God can't trust you when even temporary stuff that's going to burn up. Why would he entrust you with eternal riches? So he says, he's able, you will be enriched in everything for all liberality. You will be given the enabling to continue to be generous, not adjust your standard of living, through which is producing thanksgiving to God. Remember in the book of Romans chapter 12, he says, you who are giving, do so without, and, and the idea of it in the Greek is, without thought of return. If you are in that program of the health wealth thing, and you're going, if I give more, I'm going to get more. All giving that is spiritually uh, defensible giving is not giving with thought of return. It isn't giving to get. If you're giving to get, and you are really a disciple, what you expect is discipline. If God gives more to you, it is for the purpose so that you'll do something good with it and, and, and get it to the places that need it. And when you do that, he knows he can trust you with it. Right? He says, back in, we're going to close this off here. Don't be afraid, little flock. Verse 31, seek his kingdom. And these things will be added to you. You'll have the stuff you need. If you're serving the Lord, if you're doing his work, you'll have the stuff you need. Don't be afraid, little flock, for your father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. This is the same guy who's going to take you to heaven. And so he says, do you know what's a, an expression of that kind of trust? He's not saying you have to do this all the time with everything, but he's saying, here's one of the attitudes where you are easily able to divest your stuff yourself of your stuff. 
sell your possessions, give it to charity, make yourselves money belts which you do not wear out, not like the ones with holes back in Haggai, chapter 1. An unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near or moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know something? The very act of routinely going, I've set this aside and I've got an earmark for this. And man, it's becoming part of my security. On a regular basis, dip into that, and especially when you find a need that you can see a brother or sister in need. Because it trains your heart. Your heart has an affinity for stuff. And it tends to want to glom onto it. And it tends to want to encircle it and close it and guard it with a 12 gauge. And what you regularly, routinely need to do to train your heart is Bust that open and go meet some needs. You go, but, but then my treasure box will be empty. Yep. And if God needs you with a 300-pound treasure box, do you, do you think he can't do that? And, and, and why do you need the 300-pound treasure box? Some good questions, aren't they? So, don't worry. Don't be crippled with anxiety. Stop it. To the glory of God. One other little note. Do you know how angels say hello? If you ever meet one, you're a little worried. I don't know if it's an angel or not. Here's how you'll know. Here's how angels say no. If you're in Greek, they say kahiro, kahiro. Or if he's talking to you in English, which is more likely, he'll say rejoice. That's how angels say hello. That's how, actually how they say goodbye. Kahiro, rejoice. That's how early believers would greet one another. Walk up and you'd say, not jambo sanabona habariako, not that. They would say, rejoice. And when they were walking away, they'd say, rejoice, which is the constant reminder, I need to take joy in the provision and the dealings of God in my life. It is an outworking of the affirmation that God is sovereign. And so I remind myself by saying to my brother as I walk up to him, rejoice, which is a command. But it's a, it's a mindset. Rejoice. Take delight in what God's doing for you. And when I walk away, I say rejoice. Reminder for him, reminder for me. We are always to be rejoicing. Philippians says, taking joy, which is just the basic idea. I can trust God. I can trust God. Thy tedios amrimnos. The guy who used to always be anxious, but he got converted. And what got recorded for 2,000 years was a new surname. The guy who doesn't worry about a thing anymore. So live your life before the brothers and sisters of the Lord, before the world, that they will chip this on your tombstone. I don't worry about stuff. I got a Father in heaven. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are so eminently trustworthy eminently trustworthy. You are so good. You've already demonstrated your goodness, your kindness toward us, and that while we were, we were sinners, you, you died for us. Help us, Lord, to walk away forever from the 
soul destroying, testimony destroying, soul shrinking habit of worrying, fussing, and being anxious. Help us when those moments come to roll all of it all over onto you because, oh yeah, you've taken responsibility for that. Help us to live like functional disciples. For your glory and our joy we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll call on our music team.